Welcome everyone to this episode of This Much I Know. I'm super excited to have two friends on this podcast episode. We're going to be talking about personal finance, not just personal finance, but just finance in general and how the world of financial services is changing. Everything from ta- death and taxes on the one end and how to make that easier so that it doesn't feel so deathly, all the way to how to manage your money and, and what to do with it and how much do you actually have and where to place it and, and building out a suite of services that bridges both those ends. And to that end, we have two great guests, Trem Victor. Um, welcome. Well, thanks for having us. So I wanted to kick off with having you guys introduce each other. We'll start off with you, Trem. Um, please just tell us a little bit about you, what you were doing beforehand, and and what Tax Scouts is. Uh, thanks again, Carlos, for having me. Uh, as I said, I'm Tram. Uh, I'm a co-founder and CEO of Tax Scouts. And basically what we're doing, doing is we're trying to make sure that everyone can get their taxes sorted with as little fuss and cost and effort as possible. But about me, I mean, I'm a product guy. I've been a product guy in uh, technology for the last 10 plus years uh, here in London, in the US. Uh, You probably can't tell from my accent, but I'm actually an Estonian. Uh, I've been living here in London for well over a decade now uh, and enjoying it so far. Uh, Before Tax Scouts, as I mentioned, product guy through and through. I've been super fortunate enough to work in, in amazing companies. Uh, I was at Skype. I was one of the early employees uh, at TransferWise. And uh, I also used to work in a not very well-known unicorn pl- uh, called Playtech uh, in early 2000s, that is in online gaming uh, platform. But yeah, that's briefly about me. So uh, I leave it to you, Victor, now to do your introductions, I guess. Yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, hi. I'm, I'm Victor Chukuris. Uh, I guess I'm the founder of, of, of Plum. Um, Plum, basically, the idea behind Plum is how do we help you automate your, your money so you have more of it? So you connect your bank account, and based on the data, we see three things happen. The first thing is that we help you put money aside into savings where you can earn interest now. Then we also offer an investment products. So you can start investing that money so it grows over time. And then finally, we detect all of the bills that you're overpaying on, so your utility bill, your broadband or your loans and credit cards. And, and we like offer like uh, alternatives. So all in all, we think that by starting to save automatically and cutting your bills, you can be like kind of 10% better off in year one. And then over your lifetime, if you're investing as well, around 20% uh, better off. Um, a little history on me is I, I started as a trader in 2008 during the last financial crisis very briefly and realized that that wasn't for me. So I left. Uh, I started one business, which is an iPad POS reseller. Then uh, joined TransferWise early on when there was around five of us uh, and Tram joined. I think he joined like a few weeks after me or I, one of the two. But yeah, that was back in uh, whatever, 2013. So joined TransferWise early on, uh, helped build the international expansion team up. So like launching TransferWise across 25 new markets. Um, yeah. And then as of 2016, I've been building Plum basically. Thanks. Thanks for that, Victor. Well, let's get into some of the things that made all this possible. Um, I don't know which one of you wants to take it, but maybe, Tram, if you want. Uh, what, what, what's made all of this possible? I mean, it seems to me that there's a combination of regulatory changes, uh, consumer uh, confidence and trust and willing to try new things, maybe existing players being a bit uh, slow to respond to services, and maybe the needs of people. But maybe walk, walk us through what, what you've witnessed. Uh, to make all of these changes possible? Uh, just of it, I think you actually mentioned most of it, but in my head, it actually has been a combination of two things, roughly over the last, let's say, 15, 20 years. And the one thing that has making the entire FinTech and actually our business as well possible is the technological advancement, right? Meaning if you think of what has happened over the last 15 years, a lot of things that used to cost an awful lot of money uh, to run a business successfully, think uh, payments, uh, think doing people's uh, like KYC, understanding who they are, think of understanding the financial data, etc. All of those things have been become pretty much self-serve SaaS platforms uh, over the over the last ten years, uh, and this kind of piping or the fintech piping uh, has in effect enabled a lot of companies focus on very, very niche things in finance, 
without having to build the kind of the complexities that are uh, involved in building kind of the, all the legacy operations that are normally involved with it. That's one. And the second thing is less of the technology uh, is more has to do with kind of the, the most recent history. Uh, and I would call it the financial crisis, right? I mean, there was a, um, at the height of the last financial crisis at the 2008, uh, there was massive, massive distrust uh, towards everything that has to do with the financial institutions, starting from uh, banks and pretty much everything that touched money. And as a result of that, people's mindsets uh, changed. They were ready for alternatives. And off the back of that, you saw the kind of the first really, really big, or actually second uh, wave of really big fintechs to emerge. I think the combination of those two and kind of the technological changes that has pretty much made a lot of the things off the shelf and uh, distrust uh, that was at the peak, let's say 10 years ago, towards the kind of the traditional financial institutions kind of set the scene uh, for a lot of the fintechs to emerge. Uh, that's my very, very strong opinion. And- and that's a good point, maybe to Victor, to comment on trust. Mm-hmm. Like, how do you build trust? Because, I mean, like, the, the bigger the vision becomes for Plum, the more that you need to trust not only that you're handling my data in the right way, but that you're connecting me to all the right services. And that and that requires, like, a lot of confidence, not just in how you manage my information, but that you're going to be around, right? Like, yeah. if my entire um, savings for either a holiday or a house or, like, my children's education is dependent on you, like... How, how do you build that? How does a startup even begin thinking about that? I, I think I think the, the the important thing that I realized over time is that um, you know as fintechs you give the ability for people to kind of test the service normally quite e- like with with small amounts of money or quite easily right so okay like if we take Plum as an example right clearly you'll you'll connect your bank account which okay that, that's kind of a binary thing do I trust Plum or not to connect my bank account but. If you do, then you're saving a bit of money, right? And then you can test with putting like 50 pounds in, 100 pounds in, right? But then after two years, like um, if, if the company's still around, maybe you're going to put like, you know, maybe you're going to save 100K with Pump, right? So I think it's kind of allowing for like um, testing that isn't very financially, like you're not very financially invested, right? And, and testing in that small way allows you to build like the trust with the consumer over time. Uh, and I think as that is happening with like an individual ratio, so me and, and a user that's starting to use me to save like, you know, five pounds a week in the beginning, but then over a lifetime, you know, maybe their, their mortgage down payment. But at the same time, like, you know, I think, you know, media uh, really helps uh, build up like the general perception of startups, right? So th- the more people use you, there's this weird effect that uh, more people will trust to use you, right? So I remember when I started building Transfer, uh, Transfer Plum, uh, there was... Um, there was uh, this moment where like a friend of mine uh, wasn't willing to use us. And then we went to dinner table uh, and then some like random person there was like, ah, oh, Plum, yeah, yeah, I started using it to save money. And then that was the first time he actually used me, right? So, so I think this like kind of, uh, you get this approval by, by, by the masses and the more you're used, the, you, you, the, the more you will be used. So it takes time and, and you can't mess up. But even if you mess up, people tend to be, a lot more forgiving than than you think, right? Um, as long as you can make it up for them, too, right? Yeah. All right. Well, that's it. that's good to that's good to know. I want to touch a little bit about where that intersects with the business model. So, first of all, congrats, Tram, on the Series A that you announced in April. You know, that's it's great news, and obviously the beginning of a long journey. And you know, there's there's some probably some thoughts you can share on what it's like to scale a business and doubling down. Um, but part of that has to do with scaling a business model. Um, and, and navigating concerns investors might have of how different fintech services suffer from different historical challenges with taxation, for example, mm-hmm. the historical challenge is dealing with cyclicality. And so mm-hmm. I, I'd like for you to comment on that. And, and while you're doing that, Victor, I'll, I'll ask you the, the, the equivalent question, which is a lot of investors are considered whether or not there's a scalability issue on the business model for businesses like yours that is entirely under assets under management. And how do, how do startups break out of these sort of concerns that investors have and, and maybe what, what's the evolution of those business models? Trem? Yeah, uh, I mean, that is a really, really good question. But before I answer it, just to kind of to pile on to what Victor said earlier about how do you build the trust is the, 
I completely agree with what Victor said, but there is another really, really crucial element, and I think it applies to fintechs in across the board, especially the consumer-facing ones. Is the it is the relentless customer satisfaction focus, right? Meaning it's not just, hey, are those companies going to be around two, three, four, 10, 20, 30 years from now? It is customers want to feel like customers, that someone cares, that someone is really there for them. And this is what actually has been setting up entire fintech se sector from the kind of the uh, traditional institution is the customer is made feel that they're the king or queen, uh, and that matters a lot. And having that emotional connection uh, with your customers then over time is going to make all the difference that uh, there is. But to your question is to uh, the kind of the cyclicality and, and scaling uh, of, of taxes. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, the taxes is one of probably the most cyclical businesses after Christmas, uh, probably. Uh, but there are a couple of really important aspects to this that uh, one must not overlook is the taxes are only cyclic in, in any given country, right? And in most of countries uh, tend to have their uh, tax peak season, as they're called uh, within the industry, at different times. And at big enough geographical coverage, you're actually able to offset this uh, quite a lot. And we uh, at Tax Scouts at the moment, we're operational in two markets. We're operational here in UK, uh, where the tax peak season is in January, and we're also operational in Spain, where the peak tax season is the uh, in the middle of the summer. So this offsets this uh, a little bit. And the second uh, aspect of this really is that you need to look at the business model, how you're setting yourselves up, right? Is the most of the traditional, let's say, accountancy companies, they have fairly high set of fixed costs uh, in terms of the manpower that they need to have available in order to deal with this massive surge uh, of the demand during the tax peak seasons. Uh, we as a fintech platform, we don't. I mean, in a sense that we are a technolo technology platform and we connect people with the accountants uh, across the country uh, who are working together with us rather than having people sitting in the office waiting eight hours a day during the summer for someone to come in. And that also kind of uh, counters the uh, fixed cost tax. Uh, aspect of that. And the final thing is probably what a lot of people don't realize is that, yes, it is highly seasonal, but still more than half of the business, uh, especially during taxes, uh, happens outside of your kind of your deadline month uh, or a couple of deadline months. So this is something that gets asked a lot. But if, if you look over geography, if you look over the business model, if you look over the actual seasonality, how it evens out, um, then you can actually be quite comfortable, uh, not even at that crazy big scale, uh, to get to that point. And this is what um, kind of has been putting us at ease, knowing that, you know what, it's not just selling Christmas trees during Christmas, it's kind of selling Christmas trees in June, uh, June as well uh, for a subset of people. Okay, so build, build a company globally and a lot of these things fall on the wayside. But Victor, now to, to you, the same question, business model question, but as it applies to you guys and some of the negative yeah. potentially challenges that other players have had in, in trying to tackle this. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, uh, you know, consumer fintech, especially when you think of the neobank, like, there's been a lot of like, you know, um, not criticism, but a lot of like skepticism, especially around like unit economics, uh, you know, especially anything that's driven by car transaction revenue is is, is not that uh, is not that sustainable. You, you don't really make any like gross margin on it. Um, but for us specifically, like, because you mentioned like us as an AUM business, we always thought of us as a user business, right? So um, even though we have an AUM element to the business, which is important in the long run, I think a lot of the value will be driven from there. Uh, in the short run, we're very much driven by like, you know, how many users we have and how many of our users are kind of like subscribing as well to the service, because we also view that the fact that we, we are providing a service, right? If we can help you like better manage your money, you're probably saving, you know, a thousand, two thousand pounds more over a year, and for that, uh, we we allow a subscription service um, of like one pound and three pounds. So, so it's actually, I think we've been thinking a lot about our business model, and and I think um, we, we we subscription is now uh, an important revenue driver for us. Uh, switching is also an important revenue driver for us, uh, which means that you know when you switch someone, they save like two hundred pounds a year, and then you make a, an affiliate fee. Um, but I think you need to, if if anything. 
that I've like taken a, uh, away is that you need to have a diversified re revenue streams, right? Um, and we, we do. Uh, so we, we, we've done well during this period, right? Um, and we continue to diversify our revenue streams, right? So I don't think it's, uh, it's kind of hard to just be reliant on, on one, one way, uh, it, especially if you're in the consumer space. Yeah, that made that that resonates with me. I've I've seen more and more companies thinking about how they can add more value, and and there's a separate question which we might get to towards the end of the podcast whether or not that implies that there's can only be one winner. It's like that movie Highlander. There can be only one, and whether or not there's one massive fintech company that does everything in the future. And I know what your answer is, Victor, but we'll get to that a little later. Um, before we get to that, I wanted to ask you guys to talk a little bit about your products. You know, what is the what is the thing that you're most proud about that you've recently overcome? Or what was like the biggest thing that you kind of built where you were like, this, this is the bit about a product that you fundamentally built to overcome the key challenge. And, and now that it's out there, people have responded with great applause. Trem. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a tough one. I mean, I could talk about this uh, endlessly, but I'm gonna give you one and a half examples, uh, if you will, is the, and I'll start with the half, uh, half of the example. And the thing that I'm genuinely most proud of so far is that if you think of what we do uh, at Tax Calls, and basically what we do is this, for taxpayers, we let to get, uh, we get their taxes done with a couple of clicks by a professional accountant. It's literally as boring as it sounds. And we get it done at the fraction of the normal cost. There is like nothing more to it. But I think what we're really proud of it is the actually putting it all together. None of this is what happens behind the scenes and kind of 80% of our product actually is about automating different processes for tax preparation, accountants, et cetera, is that none of our customers ever see that and they will never see or care about this. But what I'm extremely proud of is actually pulling this together is the, the technology to do that that has been around for five plus years and in some occasions, 10 plus years, and no one has simply done it. And they haven't really done it because one, it is extremely counterintuitive for many people to think that, you know what, you can simply have a great product and great service by pulling together the different parts of and different aspects of existing fintech services and combining this into one single service. And so that's one thing that I'm proud of. And the second thing that I'm really, really, really proud of is the, uh, again, another aspect behind the scenes is that we have now built a quite a significant network of accountant partners that we work, work across the UK. We started with like one company that we work with. Now we have tens uh, and next year we'll have hundreds of partners around the uh, UK. And the fact that we have somehow managed to have a network that our customers trust based on the experience of the last three years is that uh, I could rave on endlessly about our kind of customer satisfaction numbers, etc. But the fact that being able to connect the two parts of the market where on one hand we have smaller accountancy firms that especially during the COVID uh, period where their businesses have been hit really, 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 really hard, we've been able to provide them an alternative revenue stream uh, in effect uh, to focus on what they're really, really good at uh, and making it work both for them as helping them during the tough times and also at the same time providing a game-changing service to our customers is that it's not something that's, to put it bluntly, uh, any of our future investors are going to care about or existing ones. But this is something that makes me feel really good about putting the cause before everything else. And I'm extremely proud of that. Uh, and those are the two things that come to my mind uh, immediately. Good. Victor, what what are your thoughts in terms of the biggest the biggest achievement from a product perspective that really became the aha moment for Plum customers? It, I, I gotta say that like I I think it's like you all as you build you always think that the latest thing you build will be the aha moment, but then you keep it just doesn't seem to happen like 
like that. Like, um, so I, I wish there was one like, you know, silver bullet that like, boom, you know, we, we got it and, and, and it went. But like, you know, we recently launched the ability for people to earn interest, right? So I was like, you know, we're a savings product. Now people can earn interest. It's FSCS secured. You know, I was like, that's pretty cool. That's pretty important. But like, you know, it, it's just one more thing that you layer on top. Like, and I, I think it depends what product you're building, right? But it's just another thing that I think brings value for the consumer. And like little by little, as you build this like, you know, full stack service that like kind of someone doesn't have to go anywhere else because they're getting, you know, everything they need in a way that's serviced for their needs and in a way that makes sense. I think that's really the, the defensible thing. And I don't really think it's like one feature that like uh, can, 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 can make it happen. And, and I think for us as well, the, um, to add to that, I, I think the thing that we invest in the most is 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 not like so all f- all fintechs, consumer fintechs that are doing well in a way can can build a lot of features, right? You can build an investing feature, you know, you can build a stock trading feature, you can build a credit uh, lending product, etc. But I think for us, the focus is how does that? How do you bring all of the features together? And and I, I never like the idea of a marketplace, right? Because yeah, I can chuck a bunch of stuff, and people should link out and go figure out what to do with their money. But the question is, how do you bring it all together, right? So so I think like we're, because we've already started with like seeing all of your accounts and seeing what's going on, it's kind of how at the right moment do I tell you to consolidate your bills? How at the right moment, or how do I show you that consolidating your bills can save you money and make it easy for you? So it's kind of like 50% of the work is like building the capacity in, 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 yeah. in FinTech, I feel. And the other 50 is like making it, that someone uses it, right? Is this, um, the, is this where your AI basically comes into play and basically does that for the the person? Yeah, and and we're, we're yes, uh, we're starting to invest a lot in like you know, uh, build. We're actually building. Uh, we've had a few new people that like uh, like have done this. Let's say previously or, or care a lot to do, and we're building a lot like around the next best, best action for each consumer and trying to figure out from both like what they're doing in their accounts and what they're doing in the product. What is their like state of mind? Let's say. Uh, in order to do with their, their finances, right? So we'll, we'll be investing a lot into that and bringing that up into the product as well as like the NESPEX, the best action for you, um, you know, uh, is, is something that we hope to, to to really invest in going forward. And is, there, is there a limit to that? I mean, is there, is there a point where um, it just feels like we've hit the limits of AI and helping personal finance and where where frankly it's either it's it's kind of like the old story of atms right they should have been dead yeah. a long time ago but no because people want a personal connection is there is there a limit to how companies can scale without having to push the decision making onto the individual or having the cost of having a human wealth management type function uh, personally i think there is right when you think of the i always think about it as like what is your inventory of suggestions you can give someone right and if your inventory of suggestions is like consolidate your bills is one, for instance, right? Or consolidate your like loans, right? You can't continue recommending to someone to consolidate their loans, right? It gets a bit tiring. But we do have like, uh, you know, you do have a, a live transaction list, right? Uh, where people uh, are doing something different, even though for the majority, it's like repeat behavior, but they are doing something different. And I think there you can layer something that's relatively intelligent uh, in terms of um, in, in terms of recommendation, but still, in our product, I I kind of agree with you. I think it's kind of like, how do you make it as effective as possible? Like, let's say with a product like Plum, that in the first three months, people have take certain behaviors that put them in, in a trajectory for the better in the future. I don't think I'll be able to tell something super interesting to someone every week of the day, right? Uh, it's impossible. Yeah, and I, I think I want to kind of pile on to that. Is the, I think what you're describing uh, actually very well fits into what we are doing in many ways that I think AI works amazingly at scale, right? Meaning is that in order for AI to automate, suggest and do things, you need fairly large data sets uh, in order for it to function. Where it falls short, uh, and to your question, uh, Carlos here, is the, it falls short in terms of personalized service that you don't have an awful lot of comparisons to make, right? Meaning if you are unique, if your situation is unique, this is always is going to be the case where AI is going to struggle, at least for the foreseeable future. And this is exactly what we're doing at TaxComs, right? Meaning is that kind of we automate as much as we can with technology in the background, kind of the boring stuff that you can know that applies to hundreds of thousands of people. But kind of the last mile 
is always, or this personal touch, is always with a human being. So that's why from customer's perspective, we as tax accounts are being perceived as a service that, hey, it's an online personal tax accountant, while in reality, it's a mix between the two. And I'm fair, I have fairly strong views about this in a sense is that people have been saying that kind of AI will change everything. And, it's, and machine learning and AI has been changing everything, but there are precisely these limitations uh, to it. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I want to come back to a little bit more about this and kind of what the world needs uh, at the larger sense. But first, I want to stop uh, and take a detour and talk about the organizations that you guys have built. And maybe if you can share any anecdotes that you've had of challenges, the biggest challenge you've had to overcome from a team perspective to date. So not necessarily specific to product or anything like that, just as CEOs, managers, biggest yeah. team challenge you've had yet. Uh, for us, it's actually a fairly easy one. It's a, uh, one word is COVID, uh, extremely important part, especially at the early stage uh, of any, any company is the team and the culture, right? Meaning is, and this is hugely driven by daily interactions, people coming together, enjoying each other company, going for their pints, having chats, etc. We've hired this year, like more than half of our team. Uh, purely online, as I'm sure many other companies have done. But making this work and being able to retain the unique culture of your, uh, of your company that is not entirely reliant on forcing people into semi-awkward Zoom meetings where they're kind of trying to socialize, it's really, 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 really tough. And like us as a team having to figure out, and we failed on so many fronts on this uh, in terms of like what we have uh, attempted and succeeded uh, in a few, like it has been a trial and error, right? To get to the point where we're actually happy with the results uh, as to how it works. And again, to your question, it has been getting to the point where now I would actually be comfortable saying, you know what, if COVID is gonna last another year, I think it's not going to uh, significantly uh, impact the business and especially the culture of the team that we're, that we're building. But if you would have asked me the same question six months ago, I would have been terrified uh, of, the, of, this, of this current situation. That probably has been one of the toughest things. And especially if you do this uh, globally, in a sense that we are hiring now in multiple countries, each country has a different culture, and in that sense, the experience that I had at Skype and TransferWise that were global companies from pretty much from the get-go has been like a lifesaver for us uh, as a business, 100%. Victor, you can, you can answer slightly the same and then get the easy way out, or you can answer slightly differently if you want to share another anecdote you've had. Yeah, no, I, I, I won't go to COVID other than, uh, I mean, we, we rented offices uh, during COVID, which is a bit controversial, but I actually signed leases both in Athens and Greece. We've used those offices in the period that we were allowed and like kind of, I felt it was an investment in the team and happy we did it, right? Um, but, but I think a more like kind of ongoing thing for us is um, is like we, you know, we're, well, basically, I felt that I was like kind of worrying a lot about where the business was going and, and felt that like I wanted to spread that worry like very well amongst the team. And so last after the summer, we, we ended up being around we're around 75 people now. Right. So it was kind of different to being 30. Um, and we started using the classic uh, Google OKRs. Right. Um, which was actually really cool because it like, you know, we've always had like autonomous teams that execute. But like kind of really put like really explicit KPIs and we track them like weekly now, et cetera. But like, and this is a live like kind of issue that I'm sharing right now. I don't know how it's going to evolve, right? But like people have become like in a way like overly obsessed with their uh their their, their own objectives. And like kind of like when there's new things that we need to do, it's very hard to like pull resource to do like the common goals, right? Um, so it's creating a bit of tension, right? Because you also want to maintain that agility, uh, to be able to like launch a, a, you know, like integrate something that wasn't planned like three months ago, right? Three months is like, you know, a long time in our life. Right. So, so I think like, uh, very happy on the sense that people are like, taking ownership and executing, but like, there's, there's some people feel there's like defensiveness over like resource now, right? Like this is, we're doing this, sorry, we can't help you kind of thing. Um, and then like just putting this out there, like we've also thought of like just creating a squad, um, 
that just uh, ninja squad just does like uh, shit that other people don't want to do. I was shot down uh, by my product team and marketing team and everyone else, but I still kind of like the idea. Uh, but yeah, I think it's personal. It's you. you are the ninja squad. I want to have a ninja squad that I can. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'd like to do is the truth. But uh, yeah, I haven't been allowed. Well, actually, that's a very, I mean, that sounds like an entirely different and very interesting podcast, uh, exploring the negative impact that certain initiatives can have, like an OKR. Mm -hmm. And actually, I've seen that play out in other ones, like uh, one one common one that I, um, not specific to to uh, structure like OKR, but this is around a hyper radical transparency. And then um, mm. I I, uh, I spoke to um, a founder who basically was like, no, that shit doesn't work. Why? <laughs> because what ends up happening is that your anxieties get populated to other people and then you just have a whole anxious team. And and to quote them, yeah. they said, your job as a CEO is to be um, a shit umbrella, not a shit fan. You know? <laughs> anyway. I kind of agree. Yeah. So um, moving on to more sort of broader questions. And I, I promised you this question, Victor. Now you can choose to answer it whichever way you want. Um, I kind of already know which way you're going to answer it. But is the future of the world of fintech a world where there is tons of hyper-specialized firms, each delivering the absolute best value a customer needs, whether it be in financial services, wealth management, tax advice, et cetera? Or is the world one unified company that has so much data about you that the flow between these services is a lot more seamless? Go, Tram. Uh, I think I'm probably going to be contrary to Victor because I, I honestly do say, first of all, this goes in cycles. And this, is, this is my opinion, meaning is that you have uh, companies building up the data, the services, they become uh, conglomerates, lose focus, uh, competitors come on. But like, if you ask me what is the kind of the right way of doing this, and again, I'm biased mainly because of my past experiences, because if you think both TransferWise and Skype at the day were mostly one trick ponies. I believe that you can be, as a company, you can be number one in one, maybe two things in a world. You cannot be at 10. It, it's just simply too hard, especially given that humans are involved. Is And that is pretty much it, which basically means that, yes, there are going to be companies that acquire others with the service, kind of to provide synergies, uh, as they say. But in the end, the best are the ones who have relentless focus on one thing and one thing only, and they are 10x, 20x, 100x better than anyone else. And you can't really do this if you have a divided attention. Just to Victor's point, is the same thing. Like if you have multiple teams with multiple KPIs and goals, like it automatically generates friction. And you can think of this as companies in general uh, as well. But that does not mean that you cannot have businesses that have kind of this whole horizontal layer that this tries to put this together, but can they be best in every single thing? Uh, I just I just can't see this happen. No way. Victor, tell us, tell us. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think to, to your, basically, I think my answer is that uh, you will have I think you will have a few large companies, uh, not one, because that, that was the point of controversy. But like, but no, no, you have a few big companies that basically do consolidate a, a lot of activities uh, for someone's personal finances. Uh, I believe you have a few of these. I don't think you'll have. I don't think in finance you ever have one. But you will. I think the trend right now is that you will be able to build a large company that, as we said, has diversified revenue stream slash does a lot of things for a consumer as a bank kind of used to, but like at a very, very high uh, quality um, uh, level right now. And I think you'll have those companies um, and not everyone's going to use all their services, right? There, you will still have specialized guys around. Uh, but I think right now, given like kind of, as we discussed the bit in the beginning around where technology is and, and, and how um, easy it is to build services, there's a lot, it's easy to build, well, there's a lot of regulation in FinTech and a lot of like operational money flow that you need to sort out, but you can build quite a high quality service, uh, even if it's not your like area of specialty, if you have, you know, enough smart people on it for enough time. So um, I, I think like, look, I, I always take the transfer wise, we, we always used to chat about telcos there and they said, well, just be like, it's a, it's a smaller pie, but fewer players, right? Uh, so I think that the, the pie is kind of grow, is getting smaller, like the margins are getting smaller and there'll be some players that 
uh, just just have a, a much bigger slice of it. Fair, fair. All right, my last question for both of you, and this one is a, a larger one when you factor in all the crazy macroeconomic shit that's going on, everything from Brexit to um, you know U.S. elections and and the role that fintech plays in bridging these things, including some of the challenges that I think everyone's a little worried about, which is what will happen with currency valuation as a function of having to repay national debts around the world that, that, that hit COVID. So very broad, very big, very scary question is like, what does the world need going forward? And maybe to give it a little bit more focus from FinTech founders. I'll, I'll go first. Uh, is the I, I honestly think actually what world is needing mo- actually not just fintech founders but fintech in general is I'm gonna go to the probably put the polar opposite. I think it's mm-hmm. more focus, uh, and I'll elaborate what I mean by that. Is the fintech in general at the moment is being described way too broadly. Like almost everything is fintech that is even remotely uh, tied to finances, but. I think, and this is why we started tax cuts. Because okay, what is the big and airy problem that no one really wants to touch because it's either too boring uh, or it is something that people don't want to touch with a ten foot pole? And there are plenty of such areas out there yet. But if you look at fintechs at the moment, they kind of tend to congregate in the same space or in the similar spaces. Uh, and I think that is a real, real problem uh, for fintech. Instead of okay. What are the new areas that we are going to be focusing on and building a solution that helps people globally rather than like no disrespect towards like the transvices and revoluts and N26s of the world? We don't need another bank. Like, what we need is looking what is the problem that at least 200, 500, whatever million of people are facing every world that we can solve and fix this rather than a hey, this is a uh, another bank that does thing in an app. And I think that is something that just needs to change and yeah. I think will change uh, over time. Yeah, so. I could see that. I could see that, Tram. I mean, like I had an interview with um, Martin and, and Tavi from uh, the financial beating financial crime uh, companies. And, and yeah, I could totally see where we haven't even, like there's so much leakage on financial crime that, in of itself, it's just such an area of focus. But anyway, I don't want to steal your answer, Victor. If you if you were going down that path, so on to you. Yeah, no, I mean, I, th- I think you had like a Bitcoin question in there as well. Um, but like, I mean, I've I've been getting increasing pressure to uh, offer like Bitcoin or you know alternatives as that is part of Plum. Um, and you know, I'm not, I mean, not actively considering exactly, but like, you know, I can see how. Uh, you know, you, you want to give access and give people a choice to, to, to those kind of things. But but overall, I think like I agree uh, with Tram that, uh, that, that there's no need for another bank. Right. And, and, but I think there is a need for um, companies that help people more with their money and like actively focus on, on helping people with their money because it is getting a lot more complex out there. Uh, it's a lot more volatile, like uh, from even your salary is more volatile, et cetera. So so I think like there's um, hopefully fintech companies that are like kind of consumer focused and are trying to like make people like better have more money i always think about like how do you have more money with less stress right uh and and i think uh we've always been focused on it from day one uh i think um more companies will and should focus on it right uh and and it's different to building a transactional card right versus figuring out how you can have more money right which is similar to what trams doing right It's, it's kind of a hairy problem right it's kind of easy ish to have a transactional card right uh but like you know figuring out how to personalize someone's well-being is is a bit like complex right um but but i do believe that like um as you said like i i think the role of technology is to bring efficiencies right uh and i think like money and how it's spent and 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 is wasted right and there's a lot of more to be squeezed out of like kind of how we use our current money uh, and I just think you need like, you know, come and, and those companies will have to do a lot for you. They don't do just one thing for you. They do a lot. Right. So, so, so I think, I, I think that's hopefully what will happen. And so like, I think it's a good time for companies that are thinking that way because I think the, the, the public mindset is, yeah, we, we'd like someone to assist us with uh, how to be, feel safer. Yeah. 
Yeah, that makes complete sense and, and can totally see it going down that way. Well, guys, just wanted to thank you again for your time. Really enjoyed the chat. Um, there's like 500 different angles we could have gone here. And, and I feel like we could have a part two, part three, part four. But um, thanks for joining on this episode and for sharing your thoughts. So until next time, guys, bye.